coming up, it's time to crack the kooky code of crashes and answer last episode's mad metallurgy quiz. Plus, we'll use that mad science to explain why stamping sheet metal is in fact black magic and learn you how to become a Jedi Master of Nuts and Bolts. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Last episode, I asked you to explain why cars rebound off the wall in crash tests. After all, the car is designed to crumple, right? The crumpling absorbs the kinetic energy, so if the energy gets absorbed, why the hell does the car bounce? A few people got the answer dead right, so kudos to you. The answer is in fact coming up. Some people got it a bit right, and of course I got lots of interesting answers as well. Magic pixies stroking their miniature unicorns? The power of Jesus is pushing the car off the crash barricade. It's all the junk in the trunk. That usually gets me sprung. To all you fine upstanding correspondent, I would say that miniature unicorns are slightly more credible than the power of the Lord. And if your junk is in the trunk, then your ex-wife has probably not forgiven you. Pro tip, they never do. Here now is the silver medal for outside the box thinking. The radiator, having been crushed and split, emits water vapor forwards that then thrusts the car backwards. All this on only five glasses of red. Ah yes, alcohol, the universal solvent. Now, my personal favorite, car jumps backwards because it was surprised by the crash. What's my prize? Realistically, I think we can all agree that that answer is its own reward. I used to work in this destructive testing laboratory, which was the perfect opportunity to be loud, violent, and brutal. (laughs) Only, in a good way. And we broke stuff all day long, which was so therapeutic. We had this massive tensile test rig that we stretched and broke steel samples with endlessly in the name of keeping the bastards honest. And that taught me a great deal about the behavior of steel under load. Here, we've got stress versus strain. If you're just getting out of the blocks on this stuff, just think of it in terms of load versus deflection. As you ramp up the load, the steel deflects more and then it breaks. The steel is elastic in this region. When you remove the load, it returns to its original shape. But when you move past this point called the yield point, any further deformation becomes permanent. Then it's called plastic deformation. The summit of the mountain is the ultimate tensile strength and when the line ends, the steel breaks. So if this is a bridge inadvertently loaded up to its ultimate tensile strength, I would not be hanging around mid-span admiring the view because catastrophic failure is imminent. More on that in just a sec, but now back to the quiz. Some people, of course, tried for a correct answer and missed the target emphatically. A deformable barrier on the test. No, that does not explain the bounce. The deformable blue face is just a crushable aluminium honeycomb structure that's there to simulate the crushable face of a car that you might have a clipping head-on crash with out there in the world. The car would still bounce if it hit a bare concrete block. Sorry. Equal and opposite reaction. Isaac Newton's third law of motion was very popular in the answers, but this is true of all interactions. When you sit on a chair, for example, the force your ass exerts on the chair is equal and opposite to the force the chair exerts on your ass. If it's not, then you are a big fat bastard who just broke the chair. During the crash test, the force the car exerts on the block 
equals the force the block exerts on the car, they're just opposite. But this does not account for the Y of the bounce. The concrete block will also have some elasticity. No, it won't. That is totally incorrect. The block is selected specifically for its non-participatory properties in the test. It is completely unaffected by the collision for all non-trivial analyses. Sorry. The more I look at it, the more convinced I am that the front tire is a major contributor to the bounce back. Nah. I guess it does push back a bit, but also it is only a trivial factor. The car would still bounce about the same if you threw it at the wall minus the wheels and tires. Isn't inertia part of the energy that cannot be lost? No, it's not. Inertia is a property intrinsic to everything with mass. It's like this. A two kilogram brick is weightless in space, right? But if you throw it at someone's head inside the International Space Station in zero G and it hits them, it is still going to be deadly, potentially. The reason is simple. Inertia. Conservation of momentum. Also very popular answer wise. Clearly, the momentum of the car is not conserved. It doesn't bounce off at the same speed and it is moving in a completely different direction. So that's absolutely not it. And yeah, conservation of momentum is universal, at least in Newton's universe, but where you draw the boundaries for your system really matters. Steel in daily use is designed to be operated in the plastic zone. I mean, it's no good if you're driving in your car and you go over a bump and it yields, and all of a sudden, you know, the car survives the bump, but now the headlights are pointed up at the night sky and there are all these waves in the roof. Nobody wants that. And that yield point we talked about earlier, you've felt that. At least you have if you've ever overcooked a nut or a bolt with one of these babies because nuts and bolts are all about the clamping force but maybe not these bolts you know they're just there to keep the wooden post in the steel chair and the load restraint here is being carried by shear load in the bolt there's a nut around this side of course but it's not really doing that much and it almost doesn't need to be here this type of joint is just not a clamping force deal it's a different story here Clamping force obviously matters when it comes to keeping the wheels on cars or screwing the head down onto the deck of an engine block. In fact, clamping force matters anywhere where there's a torque specification. Okay, so two reasons for that. Number one, when you're screwing a high tensile set screw into an aluminium frame, the aluminium threads are vulnerable to damage if you are over enthusiastic with the wrench so they need protecting. But when clamping force matters and you are a design engineer, you need to use the smallest fasteners you can, which are capable of generating sufficient clamping force with a reasonable margin of safety. And that means you have to get close to the yield point without going beyond it, because that vertical axis is also essentially the clamping force. But if you overdo it, you will cross the line into the plastic zone and what you'll notice is the load will come off the wrench when you reach the yield point and at the same time there will be a great deal of additional angular deflection. You will be stretching that bolt permanently, literally flushing it down the S-bend. And after that, well, the technical term for the bolt is rooted. Should be Newton meters per radian. Kilograms is mass. Everyone is a frustrated executive producer and Brett is right on the money technically. But here is my difficulty with that. If we are all engineers and scientists, absolutely true, this is black and white. Newton meters is torque, force times distance, newtons times meters. Kilogram meters is nonsense if kilograms are just mass. But if kilograms are force, then kilogram meters is torque. So my personal engineering hell is this. I'm trying to make people who never studied applied physics understand it on a practical level. And some corner cutting is therefore necessary. There's absolutely a difference for the cognoscenti between mass and force 
which is what Brett's criticism is fundamentally about. But in fact, here on planet Earth, in a non-accelerating frame of reference, one kilo of mass exerts one kilo of force. Kilos of mass and kilos of force are interchangeable in practice in these basic physics situations. Kilograms force is commonly used, although it's not part of the SI system, and explaining the difference not only confuses most people, it's also a miracle insomnia cure, and generally it makes no difference to the result. When you're manufacturing a car, much of that process involves bending sheet metal, because it all starts out on a big flat roll and you have to bend it into shape in a precise, repeatable controllable way. So we're stamping a sheet of steel in a big hydraulic press on a multi-million dollar die and we're doing them by the thousands on a brain-bendingly precise scale. This means we're somewhere up here on the curve then the press releases and the steel has this amazing characteristic where it unloads elastically. It springs back just a little bit. And if that's not mad metallurgical voodoo then I don't know what is. In fact, if you want to design those dies for a living, I think you'll be taking the red pill. The die has to be a subtly different shape than the panel it creates, because you need to bend it a little bit more in 3D space to compensate for the springy release. The finished panel has to be exactly the right shape to weld into the platform after it springs back. So the shape of the die is different than the shape of the panel that emerges. Hands up if you knew that. And the people who design those things, of course, are wizards. Here's the answer to why the car rebounds. The full answer, supported by applied science. The bounce occurs because of the overall elasticity of the entire structure of the car. The bits that are smashed and permanently deformed, plus the bits that are not, like the passenger cell, hopefully, the better to leave you shaken but not shredded in the aftermath of a real crash. The entire structure is compressed by the massive inertial load of the crash. Some of it permanently and some of it not. And I think we could all agree on that, yeah? To some extent, the structure is like a giant spring. Some of the kinetic energy that is not absorbed by crumpling the parts permanently is stored in the elastic strain of the structure. It's just like a big spring loaded up. When the car slows down enough, its acceleration tapers off, the inertial load into the wall drops off, and the de facto spring of the structure unloads. And that is what pushes the car back off the wall. It's vital here to understand that the bits that are permanently bent and the bits that are only elastically deformed, they both unload like springs elastically. So if you told me it was just the passenger safety cell unloading in this way, you were absolutely on the right track with elasticity, but only halfway there with the answer. That was the finish line for a great many of you who commented. The crumple zones stay bent, obviously, but when that inertial load comes off, they unload elastically too. This whole graph we've been obsessing about could be your car during a crash. Load versus deflection, because that's exactly what happens. Let's say this is the peak load in a crash, corresponding to the greatest deformation of the car. The area under the curve is the energy that the structure absorbs in the form of mechanical work bending the parts. Hopefully this happens in a nice controlled way over the longest possible window of time so that you don't die in a crash. That's where the kinetic energy goes to keep the first law of thermodynamics happy with your crash. But then, as discussed, the structure unloads elastically and it hands you this little triangle of energy back. And that's what really pushes you back off the wall. 
Now, just before I let you go, some people took issue with Mad Metallurgy Episode 1 when I alleged that humans were superior to chimpanzees, despite the 98% overlap in our respective DNA. Please do not suggest that chimps are not as advanced as humans in evolutionary terms. Not one single chimpanzee anywhere on the planet believes that there is an invisible deity in the sky that spies on them all day and night especially at night, many humans are yet to reach this level of intellectual development. Yes, quite. I take your point. Our species is obsessed with mortality on an individual level. And atrociously indefensible and unsophisticated mental gymnastics are conducted even today in an effort to attenuate this concern. Kim Jong-un in the sky is a prime example. Chimps just eat bananas, have mad sex, and wage war on other chimps. Amazingly, we still think we are superior. A chimp has never voted for Trump. Au contraire, I respectfully disagree. I could prosecute an argument that everyone who voted for Trump was closer to a chimp than a human. Perhaps, once again, I am unfairly maligning the character of chimps. Trump voters are, in fact, chumps. Not chimps. And finally, an unexpected comment on biology and adaptation. When you say bushes, is that the same thing we call bushes here in Tatarstan? You know, I really have no wish to explain to every woman under 40 what a bush is. They've probably never had one after all. It's like having a thatched roof. We've moved on from that. We no longer do it. Let's just say for the sake of argument, that National Geographic recently added pubic lice to the endangered species list in advanced Western countries. As is the way with so many species on the endangered list, the culprit is deforestation. I'm John Cadogan and I'm wondering, those lice, you know, is anyone truly sorry to see them go? That's the question. Anyway, it's all smooth sailing from here on in, so that's nice. Thanks for watching.